Welcome everyone again to another episode of the Idea Me Show. I'm Amanda Christensen, guest contributor and socio-digital researcher, as well as marketing manager at social media agency, Hubaka. Today, I have the pleasure of being joined by political scientist and founder of The Good Country, Simon Anholt. Simon, thank you for joining us today. Thank you, Amanda. So you've had an incredibly illuminating career to date, having advised the presidents, prime ministers, monarchs and governments of 56 countries. It would be great to start by going over how you became involved uh, in international affairs and policy and what got you down that journey. Well, thanks for asking, Amanda. I, um, it, it has been a longish journey and, and in many ways not a straight road. Um, I quite often uh, get uh, students saying to me, how did you plan this? What, where were you heading for when you started? And the only honest answer is I wasn't really heading anywhere. Um, I was just following what looked like interesting topics and seeing where they led. I got into advising governments um, basically because I got interested in countries. And there was really nothing in my educational background that had prepared me for being a policy advisor. What I studied at university was um, mainly languages and linguistics and anthropology. Obviously, the anthropology part is interesting because you learn about cultural difference. Um, and it certainly encouraged my natural tendency to be very interested in other countries. But basically, when I left university, I went into advertising. Um, but I fairly quickly um, got bored with products and companies and started getting more and more interested in countries and people. Where the two joined was the day where I um, decided that countries had images just like products and corporations did, brand images, if you like. And those images are very, very important to countries when they're trying to compete in a globalized world. And the countries with good images find that everything is easy and everything is cheap. And the countries with bad or weak images find that everything is difficult and everything is expensive. And so, Based on that simple observation, I managed to um, build a career for myself advising governments initially on how they could understand and uh, measure their national images and work out how those images came about and how they affected their ability to trade in the international marketplace. But um, it started getting really interesting when they wanted to know how they could change their images, which in a funny kind of way, I wasn't really anticipating, but it turned out that every country I ever had any connection with was dissatisfied with its image. As soon as I went out and measured it for them and told them what the rest of the world thought about their country, they were terribly upset. And they said, this is wrong, this is negative, this is out of date, this is a bunch of stereotypes and cliches, and you know, this is nothing like the reality. How can we tell them what the reality is? And so I became very interested in the idea that it might be possible to upgrade a country's image so that it was a bit closer to the truth and a bit more useful to them. First thing I discovered was that communications couldn't do it. Um, I did a ton of research over nearly 20 years and never found any evidence that telling people how wonderful your country is has any impact on their perceptions at all. In fact, arguably exactly the opposite. If you spend too much money telling people how wonderful you are, you end up thinking you must be trying to hide something. Um, so uh, propaganda doesn't work. It works domestically, sure, if you're a tyrannical regime and you want to convince your own citizens of a particular version of the story, that's possible because your version is the only version they ever hear. But internationally, no, it doesn't work. So I became very interested in why doesn't it work and what could work. Supposing you had a country that genuinely did have a worse reputation or a weaker image than it deserved, that doesn't seem very fair, and is there anything it can do? So by the time I started asking that question, I collected over a billion data points in my research, which was enough, it's big data, it's enough to start trying to extract some sensible uh, answers from it. And the answer that I extracted is the thing that people most care about is how much good you do as a country. They don't care how effectively you run your own country. They don't care how happy or prosperous or stable your population is. They don't care how beautiful your landscape is or how ancient your history is. All they care about is, should I feel glad that this country exists? Does it contribute to the stability, prosperity, peace, and future of the world that I live in? This is an important discovery. This is like corporate social responsibility all over again, in the same way that companies discovered 20, 30, 40 years ago that they needed to behave themselves if they wanted the loyalty of their consumers. So this research now tells us that countries have to behave themselves 
if they want the loyalty of their potential tourists, investors, um, visitors, and, and, and so forth. So basically, that's the story of my career, um, massively compressed right up until the day in 2012 when I decided that I was going to launch a second index, the Good Country Index, which attempted, attempts still every year to measure what each country on the planet actually does contribute to the world outside its own borders, irrespective of what it does for its own population and its own territory. Should people who don't live there feel glad that it exists? Does it do good or is it a free rider? Should we um, think to ourselves, I'm glad this country exists before we drop off to sleep at night, or should we worry about it? Now, that was a long answer to a quick question, but it's the first question. So diving off from there, looking into uh, the Good Country Index, you recently released the most recent findings, which, I'm, if I'm not mistaken, is currently based off of data from 2017. That's right, most of it, yeah. Even though we're a few few years removed, given how long it takes for all of this data to get published and get out, how can we best learn from the Good Country Index? And what have you learned so far from the insights that you, you've gathered already? It's a good question. I mean, I suppose the immediate learning is that um, it's not invariably the countries you expect um, that contribute the most. So in an effort to try to make the Good Country in in Index as far as possible a level playing field, so that it doesn't disadvantage poorer or weaker countries, what we tend to do is to divide all the results by GDP. So um, the, the, each country's ranking is relative to the size of its economy and its population. And that is the only way to do it. But when you do it that way, what you discover is that some countries actually contribute far more than you might expect. You get some unusual kind of outliers, like Ukraine, for example, a country that contributes more to sharing its own culture with the rest of the world than the United States of America does relative to the size of its population. You also discover that some really high ranking countries like Sweden, for example, although it came top, actually ranks really, really low when it comes to its contribution to international peace and security, as do in fact most Western European countries. But you, you don't get by any means the normal suspects. Um, yes, it still tends to be Nordic and Western European countries that overall rank highest, but within the detailed rankings, there are some surprises there. But I think it's also important to say what the main purpose of the index is. Um, it doesn't claim to be and can't claim to be a full account of how much every country on earth contributes, because a lot of the really interesting contributions are just not measurable in a data-driven index. You can describe, for example, how much America contributes to the world through its brands, through its corporations, through its technology. It's very, very hard to measure that in a way uh, which is directly comparable to 194 other countries. And so the results are always only going to be as I often say, like shining a torch in the corner of a very large and very dark field. So it's incomplete, but it's still better than leaving the torch switched off and in your pocket. For the simple reason that it starts really important new conversations about what countries are for. Because all of the other rankings, and there are dozens, if not hundreds of them, of countries, they all basically do the same thing. They look inwards and they measure how much each country is doing for its own population ignoring the rest of the world. So as if every country was an island in the middle of its own little private ocean and had no connection to anybody else at all, and they're all measured as separate systems. Of course, they're not separate systems. And in the age we live in today, they're all connected. Anything that goes on anywhere is going to impact somebody else somewhere. Anything you do, even in the smallest country on earth, is going to impact the environment, which belongs to everybody. And so, what the Good Country Index tries to do is to change the questions that people ask about countries. Instead of constantly asking the same question, how well is this country doing, which in different forms is the question that we've been asking since the 1950s, longer, at last now people are asking a different question, which is how much is this country doing? And it seems to me that that's the crucial question we should be asking in the 21st century. So whatever else its shortcomings may have, and Lord knows the Good Country Index has got plenty of shortcomings, Nonetheless, it's been very effective at doing that, at framing countries in a slightly unfamiliar way and getting loads of arguments going about how much countries are doing. And if the index itself can't answer those questions, I don't care as long as it's making the questions asked. Definitely. Sometimes it's more important about having the conversation than immediately coming forward with the solution. I, I completely agree exactly. with that ethos. 
Uh, so off the back of both your incredible experience as well as the Good Country Index, you have recently released your sixth book, The Good Country Equation, How We Can Repair the World in One Generation. Uh, from your experience, can we repair the world in one generation? Yeah, that's, um, that's not loose talk. That's, um, that subtitle is there for a very specific reason, because one generation is exactly how long it takes to bring up a new generation of human beings. And that, I think, is probably the only answer to the problems that humanity is facing today. So broadly speaking, what I'm saying with that subtitle and um, a big chunk of the book is about this. If you look at all the um, challenges that humanity is facing today, the ones that are summarized in the United Nations um, Sustainable Development Goals, um, whether it's climate change or pandemics or mass migration or terrorism, or human rights abuses, or poverty, or inequality, or water shortages, or whatever. All of those problems, 30, 40, 50 of them, they're all caused by the behavior of human beings. And the behavior of human beings is caused by the way that they're raised, the way that they're educated, what they learn at school, or what they don't learn at school, as well as what they learn or don't learn at home. And so therefore, by definition, if you want to solve the world's challenges, you have to change the way that everybody behaves. And if you want to change the way that people behave, you have to change the way they're brought up. And so the answer is education. Big deal. I mean, we kind of do that anyway. Almost whatever the question is, the answer is education. But in this particular case, one generation is exactly how long it could take or how short it could take if we genuinely wanted to raise a new generation of human beings who actually run towards the, gro the global challenges instead of running away from them, which is what my generation and subsequent generations have tended to do. So if you look at the, the most recent generations, what do you see? You see people like Greta Thunberg or Malala, um, children who, before they've even finished school, are becoming more powerful advocates for the causes they espouse than most adults do in the whole of their lives. And that's simply because they've been brought up in that way. Um, in Sweden, they teach climate change in schools. That's why you have uh, Greta Thunberg uh, before she even leaves school feeling that she has to do something about climate change. So we know it works. The, the, there are thousands upon thousands of uh, projects like that all over the planet, teaching climate change to Swedish school children, teaching global citizenship to Tanzanian school children. Wherever you go, you find things like this. And they almost all work if they're done properly. But they don't add up to anything because there are too many of them. They're too small, they're too fragmented, and they're nearly all just one topic. And climate change on its own is actually very misleading if you don't also consider it in the context of macroeconomics, international relations, migration, uh, pollution, and all the other things that, that fit into the jigsaw puzzle. So what I'm saying is basically this, that we need a new generation of children. We cannot fix these problems without children. I get sick of NGOs that are always saying we need to leave the world in a better state for our children. That seems to be excessively ambitious. What we need to be fixing uh, focusing on is leaving our children in a better state to fix the world and that's about as fast as we can do it so one of the things um, that I that I call for in the book um, is um, for people to help me with with this new project that I've just started which is called the good generation and the good generation is basically it starts off with a great big global conversation online with parents teachers uh, kids and wise people from every country on earth getting together and discussing what are the fundamental values and virtues and techniques and learnings and principles that we want every single child in the next generation to learn about at school so that we end up with a generation of human beings who can actually fix the mess we've made. And um, once we've had that conversation and we've boiled that list down to the bare essentials, we'll turn it into a kind of compact. We'll get every education minister on earth to sign it and then we'll move ahead and we'll implement it. So if we can do all of that, and I think we can, none of that is especially difficult, um, in time for the next generation, then we can fix the world in one generation. Or we can start fixing it in one generation anyway. Obviously, we're in a, a period of kind of extreme change with the umbrella of the pandemic looming over everyone's head, the monumentous election in the States, uh, the ramifications of Brexit here in the UK. Um, and we're all kind of coming together in a digital context. And I was wondering, 
how you see the kind of role of borders and global good from a country by country perspective evolving and changing as we do become a more digital world in this sense and what role uh, policymakers have to play in this, governments have to play in this, as well as crucially uh, from my perspective as we move towards this digital world we're going to need more and more um, policy on the side of the platforms where these conversations are happening uh, and I'd be really interested to see how you think things are going to develop in the digital space rather than the confines of one nation's border. Yeah. I think we're, what we're probably looking at is an increasingly multipolar world and that's probably a good thing. Um, for example, the idea that has become prevalent from time to time that we're moving towards some kind of global government or that that's somehow necessary or somehow beneficial for everything to be run from a single center. That's one of the worst ideas I've ever heard. Um, I mean, all my experience of government um, throughout my working life has been that government tends to be effective in direct proportion to its closeness to the governed. So small countries are much easier to run than big countries, and cities are much easier to run than countries. The closer you are to the people you're governing, the better a job you can do, and the more sensitive you can be to their needs, and the easier it is to get them to participate, which is really the crucial point. I think over, over the last um, century or so, we've all of us, not just in the West, become a little bit too accustomed to handing over the task of uh, government the running of our societies to a kind of technocratic or ideological elite and then just letting them get on with it as if we were customers and they were service providers and i don't think any good can come of that in the long term i think that society has to be a joint responsibility of the people in that society and again to do that on a global scale is unthinkable um so where does technology come in well what technology enables us to do very handily um, is to communicate, communicate across great distances and to communicate effectively, um, despite the fact that we may be talking about large numbers of people. So, for example, one of the um, applications I've personally had experience of using, which I think is truly revolutionary, is the use of artificial intelligence to moderate big conversations. And I'll be using this technology again once the good generation gets started. But a kind of AI that enables you to have um, a real natural language, open-ended qualitative conversation with an unlimited number of people simultaneously. A thing which sounds as if it breaks all the rules of nature, but AI can enable you to do that. And that's really quite revolutionary because in the past, if you wanted to gauge the feelings of a large number of people, more than about 10, you had to do quantitative research. In other words, you'd have to go out to all of those people and ask them some simple questions. And actually, it's so simple that generally speaking, they were kind of binary. Do you agree or don't you agree? And in doing so, you basically trivialize and falsify pretty much anything that's of any value. And you just end up with a bunch of statistics. 57% people, percent of people agree. L look at Brexit. You mentioned the UK. You have the, the, the tyranny of the, of the tiny majority because the question was posed necessarily, I suppose, in a very simple way. And if you boil it down to that, you get an answer which is statistically correct, but doesn't actually do to begin, begin to do justice to the complexity of people's feelings, their questions, their doubts, their ability or inability to understand the issue, and so on and so on and so on. So it's a very, 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 very rough and ready way of deciding really important issues. With AI, as I say, you can have a conversation with people. And I don't know why it's called artificial intelligence. There's nothing intelligent about it. It's basically very clearly a computer, but a very smart one that can understand what people are saying and can convert that into data. And so you have a conversation with 6 million people at the same time. And at the end of it, the AI will say to you, okay, you've got about five points of view here and here they are. These are the clusters. This is where they overlap. And then you can start doing sensible policy on the basis of that. So forgive me for taking a bit of a uh, of a long time to explain that particular application but it's one of many examples of how technology right now is actually truly revolutionary in the true sense of the word because it enables us to do things at scale that were physically impossible before and all that's very exciting kind of on the flip side of it due to the democratization of technology and social media um we have 
a much greater understanding of countries outside of our own for uh, mm. perhaps the first time since X, Y, Z traditional gatekeepers of the broadcast media, news corporations and things like that. And now we are getting a much more, although it is still incredibly biased, we are getting much more firsthand perspectives from different countries. How do you think that is shaping the much more conjecture side here, but how do you think that is shaping the kind of human experience of wanting to push forward for a better world? We're seeing social movements and protests going off in countries where events that cited them didn't even happen there, like we saw with, uh, with George Floyd and Black Lives Matter. It's be interesting to see how these kind of global ripple effects are, are affecting the overall want for, for a better world. Broadly speaking, I think it's all, I think it's all good. Mm -hmm. um, and the reason I say it's all good is because um, one of my other surveys, which doesn't, it doesn't get an awful lot of uh, public attention because it's not, it's not in the public domain apart from anything else, is a study I do every year called the Nation Brands Index, which measures uh, the images of countries. And I've been running this survey since 2005. It's a, it's a big study. It covers a sample representing about 70% of the world's population. And if you take all of the data that that survey has accumulated since 2005, and you map it on a chart, and you just do one colored line for each country's overall image, how it's risen and fallen in terms of how positively people view it over the years. You see a remarkable thing. You see almost every single one of the lines representing every single one of the countries moving as a cohort. They all gradually move up, okay? So that's really interesting because it suggests, first of all, that actually what governs, what controls the images of countries is not the countries themselves or anything they say or do, but just the international mood how people think about countries as a whole. And the second and even more important thing is that they're all rising. So I put this down to a simple consequence of globalization. As we are exposed to more and more information about more and more other places, with every year that passes, we get more and more used to the idea that we share our planet with them. And psychology tells us that familiarity tends to breed trust. So the more familiar you are with the idea of there being 193 other countries on the planet or 194 the better you feel about it so what the what the survey is telling us is that the majority of the world's population year after year feel broadly better about all other foreign countries than they did the previous year that's the way that globalization is really taking us there's a lot of bad stuff as well of course because the world is a complicated place and there are a lot of counter currents but the underlying current is that we are as as animals becoming more globally socialized with every year that passes we're becoming more used to it and as you said all of that information all of those images all of that news about all of those people from all around the world make us feel more and more and more like members of a single tribe now the pandemic although it may sound a little bit cynical to put it this way has actually been quite a good thing from that point of view because what it's done is it's reminded us literally every single day as we see the news that we really are one species because we're all suffering the same way and we're all trying to tackle the same issue and we really are one, uh, one animal inhabiting one, one planet. That's really good as well. Um, the downside, of course, is that with all of this raw information reaching us, some of it true, some of it false, some of it um, already mediated by other people and most of it not, we suddenly have to become our own editors and we don't have the training to do that. This is one of the reasons why The Good Generation is such an important project because the thing that we have to do quickly for the next generation is to teach them to be their own editors, to be able to distinguish between truth and falsehood, to understand when something is important or not important, whether it's likely to be true or likely not to be true and what the consequences of that are. We, at the moment, we're still bringing our kids up as if they were listening to the wireless um, let alone being swamped by news feeds from every corner of the earth and fake news from every other corner. The two biggest underlying themes to your work or to your insights tends to be the issues of access and agency, access to hmm. uh, other forms of thought, knowledge, information, um, as well as agency, and I guess the tools to be able to make those decisions for yourselves. That, that seems to be the kind of two biggest themes uh, to your work. Please feel free to dis disagree with me here, but... It's a new idea to me. I'm, I'm mulling it over. Um, it, I think it makes a lot of sense. Um, certainly agency, um, 
what underpins almost all of the projects I try and do is this notion that um, we all need to feel um, that we've got a bit more agency um, because otherwise the alternative to that is, is just um, inertia, apathy, complacency, or freezing in terror. And I think we always run the risk of um, people thinking that the challenges currently facing humanity are so vast and so terrifying that there's literally nothing anybody can do. And this kind of fatalism sets in. And I think that's awfully risky because, um, as I said before, human beings are the problem and therefore human beings are the solution. And the reason I wrote the book and the reason I wrote it the way I did in a very kind of um, like an adventure story rather than like a textbook is because it's very important to me that it's not just read and enjoyed by people who happen to have a PhD in macroeconomics or geostrategy. Um, it's really got to be something that anybody can understand and anybody can enjoy. Because as I always say, just because these things are serious doesn't mean they have to be boring. They can't be boring. If they're boring, nobody's going to pay attention and nobody's going to, going to fix anything. So agency is important. And, and, you know, I'm sure that most people on the planet feel the same way that I do. Um, there's little old me and there's great big world. And how hard I, I kick that ball is not going anywhere because I'm too small. And so in a way, all of the projects that I try to come up with, and the good generation is no exception, is an attempt to try to help people to uh, figure out how little old me really can kick that ball and really, really move it along. What I don't really believe in, and I don't really go in for, is the sort of mass protest movements, the collectivism, you know, uh, sign up um, and together with another X million people, you can express your dissatisfaction with the way things are being done. I just don't, I'm not even sure that that achieves anything very much, and I'm not sure that it's good psychology either. My experience um, advising leaders is that I'm sometimes there with them when on the other side of these campaigns. And if they're doing the wrong thing truly, and you know, 100 million ordinary people sign a petition saying, stop doing it, you bad man. The thing they're most likely to do is just carry on doing it in secret, just make sure they don't get found out again. They're not going to suddenly change just because a bunch of people who can't vote for them and don't live in their country tell them they don't approve. Um, I think you have to be a lot more a lot more helpful than that, a lot more supportive. You have to try and find ways of working with leaders um, to encourage them through, if you like, soft power to do the right thing. And so that's the reason why in, in the book, a lot of a lot of its focus is on finding meaningful motivations and incentives and arguments for governments to start doing the right thing not just begging them to be nice because it would be lovely if everybody was lovely because that doesn't get you anywhere and nations are not moral entities and neither on the whole of the people who run them you've got to say to them look this is why it's in your direct interest to do something about your country's emissions or the number of refugees you accept uh, or the way that you treat your indigenous population or the way you treat women in your society, whatever it is, it's not enough to say you can do this because it's the right thing to do. It's too easy to ignore that message. It has to be, here is a very, very sound reason why it will benefit you to change your behavior. And there are loads of those in the book. And I think ultimately that's the way we have to do it. It's, it, may, it may make me sound cynical, but it's not meant to. I think people just need good reasons to change their behavior. Looking at your life, uh, your career to date, um, the effects that you've had on a global scale, is there one person, a group of people who has had um, a profound impact on your direction? I know you, you said your journey has been through lots of twists and turns. Perhaps you might still be back in advertising or down a completely different path if you hadn't met X person or, or Y person from your past. I think it's everybody I've ever met. I mean everybody you ever meet and you engage with ends up correcting your course in some tiny way, if you allow them to. Um, any conversation you have, this conversation, it, as long as your mind and your heart remain open, which I think is the natural tendency for people, um, any encounter can make a minute correction to your course, but you just have to, you have to keep open. So I don't go in much for I never have done for gurus or mentors because I've never been very keen on the idea of one individual being responsible for too much of my thinking. Mm -hmm. um, that just doesn't really work for me. I suppose I'm lucky because of the, the, the job that I've spent most of my career doing, 
I've been working with people who run countries and they're not better people than anybody else, but they do have a different experience from most other people in the sense that they're dealing with really, really consequential decisions every day of their lives. And that does make their experience very different from other people's. And learning from them, not necessarily because they're trying to teach me, but just learning from the experience of meeting them and observing them and trying to help them do their job better. Um, nobody could ask for a, really a more interesting training than that. Uh, because all of those countries are so different and who run them are so different. And the thing I have to say is that the vast majority of them are really not bad people. There's a, there's a, there's a tendency often, um, because politicians are becoming, for very understandable reasons, extremely unpopular these days in many, many countries, there's a tendency to assume that all politicians do what they do in bad faith and that anybody who wants to become a politician is just hungry for power or money or something something bad. Um, and I couldn't say, but on the basis of the leaders that I've worked with, that really doesn't seem to be the case at all. They all seem to be doing what they're doing for very good reasons. And it's a really tough job. Um, sure, there are privileges that go with it. Um, but the impression that I get is that the vast majority of them became politicians because they had a strong ethic of public service. They did actually want to do something for their country. What's sad is how many of them, by the time they've been there for a few years, begin to realize that it's almost impossible for them to do that. Um, and what they often end up spending most of their time doing is trying to desperately figure out how to tell things to people because they have so little influence over it. So, you know, even your head of state has remarkably little influence over things, even your head of government. And that's why so often they end up just, you know, being PR merchants. How can we spin this in a way that makes it most palatable for the population? And that more than anything else is a symptom that politics has really, really gone badly wrong. Thank you very much for taking the time to join us. For everyone who's been listening to the podcast, we've been speaking to Simon Anholt, policy advisor and founder of The Good Country. Thank you very much for an interesting conversation.